Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Fort Hill Community Church. If you want to turn your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 21. And today we're going to see why Roundup exists, why Weed Killer exists. Today we're going to see the judgment of God on the man. Whenever, uh, that's sort of an interesting way to, <laughs> to intro the message, but it's true. It's true. This is why Roundup, this is why we need Roundup. Whenever I was uh, younger in high school, I, I just started college actually, um, my, my cousin worked for a landscaping company. The guy's name was Joe Buston, Joe Buston's Landscaping. And I had long hair in college, uh, end of high school, beginning of, beginning of college. It was like down to here. It was actually high school. It was like down to here. And this guy did not like me because of my hair, I think. I, thought, I think he thought I smoked a lot of pot or something like that because of my hair. And, you know, truth be told, if I put on a beanie, I did look like a pothead. Um, but he did not like me at all. And he made me go around this this. Uh, this house we're working at and pull up as many weeds as I could find and truth be told I couldn't find any weeds at all and then I looked under a bush and I found the the biggest weed I've ever seen in my entire life and I had such a sense of accomplishment whenever I found that weed and I pulled it and I pulled the weed and there's really no point to that story I just wanted to tell you as an intro into the message today I really had no other I had no other intro that was it that's the only connection, the weed. Um, today, we're going to end the three-part fallout of man's fall uh, into sin. The, the three-part judgment that God brings against the serpent is the first one that he judges. Adam and Eve eat of the tree. God says, Adam, where are you? What did you do? I ate of the tree because the woman you gave me. The woman says, I ate because of the snake. So this blame game, God approaches the snake. He says, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock. Then he judges the woman. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, contrary to him, but he shall rule over you. That was two weeks ago, last week for the woman. And today, today we're going to get into uh, God's judgment on the man. This is the longest judgment of the three judgments. Just as with the woman, this is a judgment of pain. So a real encouraging message today. But it is one that leads to life. There's a judgment of death, but on the other side of death, Eve is known as the mother of all living. This is a judgment of days full of toil. This is a judgment of days full of burden. What was once easy will now be difficult. And at the end, Adam, we will see, will die as all men and women will die. This is not an auspicious start. Toil, labor, death. Very, very dark clouds, but not completely dark. Today we're going to look at the dark clouds, but we're also going to see the rays of gospel light that God shines through the darkness. But you have to have eyes to see it. And God willing, He'll give us eyes to see it this morning. We're going to explore these clouds. We're going to get answers to some of the deepest questions of life. Why is life difficult? Why is life hard? Why is there pain? Why is there death? Those are great questions, and they're not easy to answer But we do have an answer. We do have an answer. God did not make the world to die. God did not make this world so that there would be pain. That's not what he made by his design. And we're going to see what happened. In the midst of these terrible judgments, God gives light. He gives grace. He gives life. The darkness has come, but light will overcome the darkness. We're going to look at Adam's faults, what he did wrong. We're going to look at Adam's fallout. And at the end, we're going to look at God's grace. 
And uh, I'll just say, in this type of message, these are the types of messages that make me mad. And not at anyone in particular. It makes me mad that the world is the way that it is. It makes me mad that I wake up Saturday morning and I see nation rise up against nation. It makes me mad that there is so much death and destruction in this world. It, it makes me mad because that's not what God created the world to be like. And it makes me mad because He has given us a Savior from all of these things. And yet the world falls deeper and deeper into darkness. Today I want to shine some light. If you've ever had these questions, why is there pain? Why is life difficult? Why is there death? I want to show you why and then offer you a way forward. So let's read Genesis three seventeen verse 21. And this is what it says. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. What a turn. From dust to dust you shall return. Adam names his wife Eve because she's the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. We're going to start in verse 17. And we're going to look at the fault, Adam's faults, his fall into transgression. We're not going to spend a whole, whole lot of time on this, but we're just going to kind of touch it briefly. The fault is twofold. Again, God looks at the serpent, gives his cursing. He looks at the woman, gives his judgment. And then he looks at the man and gives his judgment. And he says this, two things. Because you have listened to the, to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. So two, two specific things that God calls out. Now, those are connected. He eats of the tree because you listened to the voice of his wife. But it's interesting, he begins it this way. Because you did this. It's the same type of construction for the snake. Because you have done this, cursed are you, snake. He doesn't, God doesn't say that to the woman. He doesn't say because you, you fell for the lie. He just goes into the judgment of the woman, but he does specifically point out what Adam did in these two things. Because you did this. Because you did this. There's two ways we can take this. We all have the general responsibility to listen to the voice of God above all other voices. I think about Jesus, um, who said he's the good shepherd, and that the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. The, the sheep know whenever the shepherd is talking to them. They know the voice of God. They can distinguish. They, we've got all these voices coming at us. We've got the voices of this world, the voices of the enemy, the voices of those who would try to deceive us, and we have the voice of God. We have the responsibility to listen to the voice of God above all of the voices. For Adam, he didn't listen to the voice of God. He listened to the voice of his wife. He rejected the voice of God. God said, don't eat, and yet he ate. For us, we have to follow the word of God. It's that simple. And that's what you would expect to hear. On a Sunday morning, the pastor tell you that you need to listen to God, right? And what's tragic is that we hear that so much and we grow numb to it. And it just doesn't land, especially whenever we see just how tragic existence is whenever we don't listen. That's the general fault of Adam. He listened to another voice. He did not listen to the voice of God. But I think there's more going on here than just that. It says again, because you listen to the voice of your wife. Now, husbands, don't take this home and say, I don't have to listen to you. That's what Adam messed up in the first place about. He listened to the voice of his wife. That's not what's going on here. Adam transgressed God's command, but he also felt as a husband. He also felt as a husband. 
Remember whenever God confronted Adam earlier, what did Adam do? He blamed his wife. What a weak coward of a man to blame your wife for what you did. Genesis 3.12, God said, What have you done, Adam? And Adam says, The woman whom you gave to be with me, it's her fault, your fault for giving her to me. Couldn't you give me a better woman? She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. God is saying to Adam, that excuse doesn't fly. That excuse doesn't fly, Adam. It's your responsibility. You were in the garden. You didn't intervene. If you read the story of the temptation, it says that the woman gave the fruit to the husband who was with her. Adam was there the whole time. He heard the snake lying, confusing, questioning, and he did nothing. He didn't intervene. He didn't lead. He didn't protect. He did nothing. All he did was stand there and eat. Typical guy. Stand there and eat. He didn't listen. He didn't lead. He followed her into sin. It was your responsibility to lead. You are, you are her husband, the spiritual head. You didn't do anything. This is why God calls out to Adam in the garden, not Eve. God says, where's Adam? He doesn't say, where's Eve? This is why they know their nakedness after Adam, eat, Adam eats the apple, not Eve. It says Adam eats the apple and they both knew that they were naked. And this is why the sentence of death comes to all of mankind through Adam and not Eve. So folks that make jokes that all the world's problems started because of a woman, God does not agree with that. It's Adam's fault. He failed. He failed generally not listening to the voice of God. He failed as a husband, as a spiritual leader. He did not protect and lead his wife well. And we see the fallout. And this is where I want to spend the majority of our time. The fallout is in the second half of verse 17 all the way to verse 19. And the fallout is one thing in particular that's easy to, to go over. It's easy to miss, but I, I want to center you on this one particular fallout that leads to the struggles that we have today. And the fallout is this. Because of Adam's sin, the ground is cursed. Now that's interesting. I'll just read it, okay? Because you did all of this, verse 17, second half, Cursed is the ground because of you. So you did this, and the result is a cursed ground. And now because the ground is cursed, these are the things that happen. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. You go to get plants, you get thorns and thistles. You go to get bread, you get sweat on your brow. And then eventually, Adam, you will die. From dust you came, from dust you shall return. Prior to the fall, there's a context here, okay? Prior to the fall, man had a really great relationship with the ground. Now that sounds kind of funny to say, but that's exactly what it was. They got along great. They were best friends. In fact, man was made from the ground. Genesis 2-7 says this, Then the, lo the Lord God formed the man of, the du of dust from the ground. Great relationship. Birthed from the ground. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of of life. After this, in verse 8, God plants a garden and he puts men in the garden to take care of it. So not only is, is, is life, does life come from the ground, but also sustenance as man works and keeps the ground. This is connected to the creation mandate. We've looked at this a lot. Genesis 1, 28. God blesses Adam and Eve and he tells them to do certain things. He says, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That falls mostly on the woman as the life giver, as the one who has children, because Adam can't have kids. And then the second, to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Adam, you're going to make a family. You need to provide that for that family. You need to subdue the earth. And the earth will yield to you. The earth will yield to you. Genesis 2.15. Genesis 2.15 says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So he has life from the ground. He's going to accomplish the commands of God by subduing the earth, the ground, 
and he's given two specific tasks to work the garden and to keep the garden. He is a gardener and he's a guardian. So that's the context. That's the context of the curse. The situation before the fall. If you remember last week, we said that God's judgments, they don't come out of nowhere, but are informed by his prior commands. Adam was made to work the ground, to subdue the ground, to have dominion over the ground. And now this work is going to be a lot, lot harder. Okay? That's what's going on. Sin disrupts. Uh, Sin makes hard the commands of God. And really, we know that sin makes it impossible for us to keep God's commands. And so the curse of the ground teaches us two things. First, that life will be difficult. And the second, that death is certain. Life will be difficult, and death is certain. Uh, Noah, could you check in on Ed? Yeah. Um, so let's, let's go back to verse 17. Look at what it says for me. Verse 17, the curse of the ground. It says this, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain shall you eat of it all the days of your life, Thorns and thistle it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Can you imagine, you did something in the past that was so easy, and then you go back to it, and it becomes incredibly difficult. It's like, I've never, I've never, uh, you know, hurt my leg before, but, you know, folks that maybe hurt their leg or destroyed their knee or something like that, and now they have to go around on crutches. And life is just a billion times harder from that point on. That's kind of what's going on here, except a lot worse. Before, the earth yielded itself to Adam, but now work is slow, it's difficult, and he's not going to have a lot to show for his labor. It says this, In pain shall you eat of the field, of, of the ground, all the days of your life. This is just like the woman, right? Just like the woman. The woman... Now, she's going to have pain in creating life. Now, there's going to be pain in sustaining life. Uh, Genesis 1.29, God gave the man food to eat. He gave him every plant to eat. And now, whenever Adam goes to eat those plants, he's going to find thorns and thistles. The food is still there, but he's going to find thorns and thistles in the midst of the food. Maybe he can use them as toothpicks, right? Turn a... Take lemons, turn and lemonade, right? If he wants bread, he's going to have to sweat for it. He's going to have to work for it. The point is this. Life is going to be hard. Now that sin is in the world, you just got to survive now. In fact, that word survive didn't even exist before Genesis 3. It was never a question. The only word they had was flourish, thrive. But now you're going to have to survive because life is going to be difficult. If you took away all of our modern conveniences today and you put me in the woods, I'm going to die. I'll just be honest with you. I'm not going to make it out. I just never developed those skills. And, you know, because we live in an age you don't really have to, abundance has ceased. I want you to, to see that it's not that work is a curse. Some people feel like work is a curse. It's not that work is a curse. Work is a gift from God. It's that the ground is cursed. That's the issue. Work is hard. It's difficult. We don't always get out what we put in. We will get thorns and thistles in addition to plants and bread. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2 and 3 says this. I'm going to go ahead and read it if I can get there in my Bible. If you guys have ever read Ecclesiastes before, uh, you know that it speaks to a lot of these themes. The writer says this, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Verse 8. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. There's a part of the curse that reminds us that we keep nothing in this life. That life is very short. That it does disappear on us that it does disappear quickly that we think we're all set we're good we're going along and then finally something happens and it was much more in doubt than we even knew it 
hung on the edge of a knife. Life is hard, and we keep none that we toil for, what little we do gain. Here I think about Jesus that tells us not to store up for ourselves treasures on earth, but store up for ourselves treasures in heaven, because in heaven, thieves cannot steal. In heaven, we can't lose what we gain all at once. In heaven, moth and rust can't destroy. In heaven, we can't lose little by little over time to where we finally have nothing. In heaven, it is secure. Life will be hard. You won't have much to show for it, and what little you do have, you won't be able to keep. Have a great Sunday. See you later. See you next week. But there's grace here, too. I want the darker the clouds, the more beautiful the sun whenever it breaks through. There is grace here. Despite the hardness of the earth, man will still be able to eat. The ground is hard. It's not rock. There's thorns and thistles, but there also is plants and bread. Heavy toil will lead to a harvest. It's just hard. It's hard, and that's something I think about. It is not easy. Pastoring is hard. Uh, Just this week, we've had so many folks struggling in the church with different things. Raising a family is hard. Being a husband is hard. Having a job is hard. And it's even hard without God's grace and mercy. Uh, But for those who turn to Jesus, there is grace. It says this, Colossians 1.29, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. You see that. For this I toil, struggling with whose energy? My energy? No, his energy, that he powerfully works within me. That's difficult, but it's not as difficult as the second result of man's sin. If you want to turn there with me, I'm going to read the second half of the curse. The ground does not yield to man, and now it's become something much worse. Where once he, came, he brought life from the ground, now it becomes his grave. Verse 19, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and the dust you shall uh, return. Going back to God's initial design, the ground was Adam's source of life. He was made from it. He was called to protect it, to keep it. But now that the ground has been cursed, it's all flipped. Just the irony here. The ground was a source of life, now it's a grave in death. It was a source of life, now it's his grave in death. Now he has to protect himself from the ground. He was supposed to protect the ground, protect the garden, now he's got to protect himself. But in the end, he loses. From dust to dust. This is the final destination of all men. That's the one certainty. What do you say? Death and taxes, right? Death and taxes. The destination of all men, the final destination, the grave for all those who persist in their rebellion against God. It's the hard truth, and it's one that you can't argue with, right? Everyone dies. Now, from a purely atheistic, materialistic worldview, they have no problem with that. That's just kind of how things are. But from a Christian worldview, we know that that's the tragedy of life, that there is death. It was never meant to be that way. It's not why God created the world for it to die. We get an intense example of this death in the book of Numbers. We're going to go here. We're going to be here a little bit, guys. I'm sorry. The story of Korah's rebellion. Do you guys know this story? This is a gnarly story. This is one of those stories that if you're a guy, you're like, oh, that's awesome. If you're a girl, you're like, wow, that's terrible. This is a story. The story of Korah's rebellion of death and the grave. I'm just going to read it quickly, give you the background. Moses is leading Israel through the wilderness. Israel came to the promised land. God said, go in, take the land, it's your land. Israel said, "Uh, there's people there, they're scary, we don't want to go in there. God says, because you didn't follow me, you're cursed to walk through the wilderness for 40 years. So they're walking through the wilderness. As Moses is leading Israel, there's some people in the camp that do not like his leadership or his teaching from God's word. And this is what it says in Numbers 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, son of Kohath, 
Kohath, son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation chosen from the assembly, well-known men. This is a crisis of leadership. Moses, I, I feel bad for Moses. He's got all these people. He's trying to minister the word of God to them, lead them through the desert, and now he's got 250 of the leaders that are coming against him to dispose him. Verse 3, They assembled themselves together against Moses against Aaron and said, You have gone too far, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? We can be priests too. You are just taking the words of God and sort of hoarding the leadership for yourself. God didn't call you. We get to be priests too. The truth is that they, they weren't. They, 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 they couldn't. God chose Moses and Aaron as priests. But these men wanted to take the position, the position for themselves. They don't submit to Moses. By extension, they don't submit to God. And look what happens to them. This is the gnarly part. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. So God is not about this coup that's happening. Moses and Aaron say, don't take out all this people. Just have judgment on the ones that have come before you. Just have judgment on the ringleader. Just have judgment on Korah. And this is what happens. Verse 31. And as soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their whole households. These are the people that rebelled against Moses. And all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol. And the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. How terrifying is that? That is absolutely terrifying. And that's the result of the curse. As terrifying and startling as this is, the truth is that God just sped up the timeline. The point was to solidify Moses' position as leader of Israel, but the result is the same as it would have been anyways. Whether you are in the ground from an earthquake or in the ground six feet under with all your family in attendance to mourn your death, this is the judgment of God on man's sin. From dust to dust. Because of sin, death. Why is there death? Because of sin. Death is our enemy, against which man struggles the most. I uh, read a news article about a guy who would infuse his body with his son's blood to help him live longer, trying to cheat death. This is foolishness, no one can Psalm 90, verse 9 and 10. This is Moses, the same Moses that saw what happened to Korah. Says this, For all of our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. If we get there, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Death is inevitable. It comes to all men, it comes to all women. And the clouds are really dark. But there is a ray of hope. We have to make the clouds dark. I I know it's heavy stuff. I have to make the clouds dark because then the light's not going to shine as brightly. It says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 25. For he, Jesus, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The curse of Adam, from dust to dust, who will save us from this judgment? Jesus will. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. What an amazing change that the one thing that we all share in, death, that's the thing that God himself destroys. Now the question is how, and what does this have to do with Genesis? Well, let's go back to Genesis And I'm going to go and take you on a little journey. And it's going to be a little deep. Hold my hand. We're going to get through it. I want to, I want to look at the whole cursing judgment of all three. 
the serpent, the woman, the man. Circle in your mind, in 1 Corinthians that we just read, about the enemies of God being put under the feet of Jesus. And then keep that in the back of your mind, and then remember that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. If you look at these cursings in Genesis 3, I think something bigger is going on. If you take it as a whole, there are four characters in this judgment. There's the serpent, there's the woman, there's the man, and then finally there's the ground. There's God, obviously, but serpent, woman, man, ground. And it's interesting that only two of those are cursed. The serpent is cursed, the book ends. The serpent is cursed, and the ground is cursed. The man and the woman aren't cursed. The man and the woman are judged, but there's not a specific cursing of the man and the woman. And the man and the woman both struggle against what God has cursed, but they don't struggle in the same way. The woman struggles against the cursed serpent. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So the woman has her own battle over here against the cursed serpent. The man has his own battle against the cursed ground. Verse 19, from dust to dust. So there's these two battles going on. These, they're not there, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fight. It's the, the man isn't battling against the serpent if we're strictly following the text. And then the woman isn't battling against the ground. It's the woman versus the serpent, the man versus the ground. But not both win. If you look at the ground, does he win his battle? No. He doesn't win his battle. He loses. From dust to dust. The man fights the cursed ground and he dies. But look at the woman. Does she win her battle? Let's read. I will put enmity, serpent, between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. The woman is going to win. The woman is going to win. The offspring of the woman is going to defeat the enemy. So the woman wins her battle through her offspring. The man loses his battle against his cursed opponent, the ground. And then you have this this single elimination tournament, right? You guys know if you played soccer growing up or basketball or whatever, you have two teams that play, and then the winners of those two teams come and they play against each other. So now you have the victor, the offspring of the woman who won here, and then you have death, the ground, the grave that won here against the man, and now they fight each other. And who's going to win that battle? So we'll go back to 1 Corinthians 15, 25, and 26. Remember, listen, Jesus is the offspring of the woman. Jesus was the promise. God said, I'm, I know Eve, you messed up. I'm going to bring someone from your line who's going to defeat your enemy. We go back to 1 Corinthians 15. What does it say? For Jesus must reign until he has what? Put all of his enemies where? Under his feet. What does the offspring of the woman do? Crushes the head of the serpent. On the cross... Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities of this world. He triumphed over them. How? By nailing the record of debt that stood against us. He put it on the cross. And then what does it say? The last enemy to be destroyed is what? Is death. Man lost to his enemy. Man lost to the ground. Man lost to death. But then Jesus comes and he says, that's my enemy and I'm going to defeat that enemy. He destroys The laying of the body in the ground was a sign of defeat, but the resurrection of the body was a sign of victory. Every man loses, but the God-man wins. Acts chapter 2 says this, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Adam has hope. You have hope. Humanity has hope. The offspring of the woman has defeated the enemy of the man. The curse of the ground that swallowed up man has now itself been swallowed up in the victory that's offered to us through Jesus Christ. Death is not the end. That's what I'm saying. 
Death is not the end. God will bring life from death. You've got to believe that. And he has shown that to us because the grave that claimed every single life billions and billions and billions of time, times over did not claim the life of Jesus because he triumphed and he rose from the dead. He defeats the serpent and now he defeats the last enemy, death. The tomb is empty. Up from the grave he arose. And if that's true for him, it's true for Adam. It's true for you. It's true for those who place their faith in him. Romans 6, 4, we were buried. Therefore, with him, by baptism, into death. In order that, just as Christ Jesus was raised from the dead with the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. There's only two ways to be buried, either in Christ or out of Christ. And it's only those who are buried in Him rise again. What a picture of God's grace. What a picture of God's grace. I need you to know that. I need you to get that. I need you to embrace that. I need you to believe that. You can rise again. The curse of the garden, the, the light of the gospel, shines through and it shines through we just saw that now it's going to shine through even more verse 20 and 21 the man called his wife's name eve because she was the mother of all living and the lord god made for adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them adam just received the sentence of death and yet in the next breath he calls his wife the mother of all living I think Adam saw something that we maybe don't see. That name Eve means life giver. She was the mother of all living. That's what Adam was thinking. It's so incredible. The last time Adam even spoke about his wife, he accused her before God. The last time Adam spoke about his wife to God, he said, it's her fault. And now after receiving the judgment of death, what does he say? My wife will bring life again. I think he saw childbirth childbirth will be painful, but we're still going to have babies. The ground will be hard, but we're still going to eat. We're still going to get food. God said, the moment you eat of that tree, Adam, you're going to die, but he's still alive. And more than that, God made a promise. That sneaky, slithering snake that came forward and deceived my wife, she's going to have a son that's going to crush that snake's head. From her loins will come someone who will bring life, a champion, a victor who will defeat our enemy. I think that's what Adam sees. I think it's not just having kids. I, I think it's the promise that God said, there is enmity between you and the snake, but you will win. His wife was to see, but she's going to play a big role in that. From her loins, we have Mary, who has Jesus, the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. So he calls her the mother of all living. But there's something else here, and this is, to me, the climax of the rays of life. Verse 21 And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. God sees the nakedness of Adam and Eve, but he doesn't leave them naked. The point is he sees their sin, but he doesn't leave them in that state. How are Adam and Eve going to deal with their nakedness? This is different. How are we going to deal with it? Well, we can see how they tried to in the past. If you go back to verse 7, It says that the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. How do we deal with our nakedness? Well, if you look at Adam and Eve, they used fig leaves to cover themselves. They used the works of their hands. So many people try to cover their nakedness with the works of their hands. Because we have fallen from God, because of our sin, because we're naked, because we're exposed, because we have to come before God and give an account for our lives, we think we can make up for that 
It's through good works. By trying to be a good person, whatever that means. By attending church, by saying the right things, by volunteering in soup kitchens. You can list out the ways that we try to outweigh our bad with good. If I do that, I'll be presentable to God. I'll be able to cover all of this. But that didn't work. That was their first try at it. That didn't work. Because deep down they knew that it wasn't going to work. And we know that they didn't think it was going to work. Why? Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves. They tried to cover their nakedness, and this will work, but the moment God approaches, they hide themselves. It doesn't work. They thought their lone claws were enough. They wouldn't have done that, but they do. One way we deal with our nakedness is through good works. I'll be a better person. The second way we deal with it is by running away from God, hiding ourselves from God. We either pretend He doesn't exist, there is no God, or we run away from Him. We isolate. We stop coming to church. We stop being a fellowship. We stop pursuing the Lord in prayer. We stop pursuing the Lord in His Word, especially if there is sin in our lives and we don't want that conviction. We don't want to change. We don't want that burden. We close off and we run away. We don't receive the hard but gracious sanctifying work of the Spirit within our lives. This is how man deals with his nakedness. This is how man deals with his sin. Run away from God or try to assuage our conscience by being a good person. What does God do? And I'll, this is where we're going to end. Two things. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. The first thing, God covers their nakedness. You cannot cover your nakedness. There's no amount of hiding. There's no amount of good works. There's no amount of any of that that's going to cover your nakedness. That's going to cover your sin. That's going to save you. Salvation is wholly a gift of God. It's something God does. These people were trying to deal with their issues and God comes in. He says, I'm going to do it. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. All these strivings that you have, all this trying, all this working, all this, this shame maybe you feel, the judgment that you, you have, the not good enough, all this stuff that comes and accuses and accuses and accuses, or this working, or on the flip side, maybe you think you're really knocking it out and you're prideful. This just takes all of that and throws it where it belongs, in the grave, to die. It is God that saves. Salvation is a gift from Him, not a result of works. How does He do it? Second, the covering of their nakedness came through the shedding of blood. The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins. This is the first time blood is shed in the Bible. It says they were covered with garments of skins. An animal was killed in order for their nakedness to be covered. It says in Hebrews 9 that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of the blood, there's no salvation. Without the shedding of blood, there's no covering of nakedness. They had loin claws before, but they didn't work. Why? because there's no shedding of blood. It was leaves. Now that sin has entered the world, an account must be made. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Because sin enters the world, there will be death. Because sin, death. But God here shows us a beautiful truth on which the whole gospel rests. There will be death, but it doesn't have to be your death. A substitute can be given to atone for the sins of another. Adam deserved to die. That's what God said. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. But now God shows grace. And instead of Adam dying, the sacrifice dies. And God accepts the death of the sacrifice in the place of Adam. He covers him with the blood of the sacrifice. This is the light of the gospel. God provides a sacrifice for our sin. And his name is Jesus. 
He's the one that crushed the head of the snake. He's the one that defeated death in the grave. He's the one that walked out on the third day. And he's the one that takes our nakedness and covers it so that now whenever I come before God, he looks at me and he sees all the righteous perfections of his son. And he says, you, Aaron, I am well pleased because I'm well pleased to my son. And that's exactly what you are. Son of God, daughter of God, through Christ. The curse of death on man has an answer. And his name is Jesus. You can try to cover yourselves with all the fig leaves. Heck, get banana leaves. Whatever leaves you want to try. You can run away from God as far as you want by any plane ticket you want to try to get an answer to the burden of your sin. The only thing that is going to satisfy and save is Jesus. That's it. That's what we see. The curse is no claim on those who are the Lord's. But the only way you receive that is through repentance and faith. You have to turn from your sins. As hard as it is, that's where life is. You have to turn from your sins. You have to place your faith in Christ. You have to receive the grace of God. And He will deliver you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the power of your word. I want to thank you that right here in the midst of it, right at the ground zero of the curse, of the judgment, of sin, right at that moment, you showed the gospel of grace. Right at that moment, you said, this is your situation, but I will deliver. And what I hate is everyone who was still lost in darkness. Everyone who is still lost in marching to death. The sacrifice has been made. The provision has been brought. The covering is near. Death does not get the final say. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? There is no sting. It's swallowed up. I pray, Lord, that we would believe that. And that's always the battle. The truth is there. The tomb is empty. We just don't believe it. We don't believe it. So many embrace death. They embrace sin. Lord, I pray that you would come and just as Jesus did with Lazarus, say, arise, wake up. There are so many people in their tombs, even today. Come to them and say, arise, wake up. Call them out. Deliver them from death. Lord, for me and for those that have trusted in Christ, we know that life. And we yearn that all would have it. We pray against the enemy. We pray against the serpent. We pray against those that would blind the eyes to not see. Shine the light of your gospel of grace into our hearts, into our minds, into our eyes. And today bring forth harvest of salvation. Lord, we love you. We know that we will see you again. There is a day coming that every tear is wiped away. All mourning is ceased. We do yearn for that day but we yearn even more that as many would come with us we lift them up to you we lift our hearts up to you today we love you lord pray these things in the name of christ jesus amen